All right, guys, so this is Ross. In today's video, we're gonna talk about winter prep. Um, not just of the fig trees, but a couple other things I wanna talk about and touch on in this video, just getting everything prepared for the winter time. Um, first off, what I think you wanna pay attention to with the figs, just really quickly, is that you need to pay attention to how lignified this growth is. If it's not very well lignified and you want to take cuttings, um, I would take cuttings before it gets too cold. Uh, a hard frost, which is probably something around maybe 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and that really kills a lot of plants. So a hard frost. If that hits some really unlignified growth that's very green and actually not very hard, like it's easy to bend it, you're going to lose that growth. That growth's going to get damaged. You're not going to be able to root it. You're not going to be able to sell it. I mean, you shouldn't sell it anyway, but um, you probably can't save it at that point. You should take the cuttings beforehand um, if you're intending to use it. Um, in terms of the potted trees, we still have um, really a couple frosts that have to come in because these guys are a bit more hardy. They have wood that's lignified super, super well. I mean, this is like totally brown. Um, it's even a bit shriveled in appearance, which is uh, aiding a little bit more, I think, into that hardiness factor. Uh, the potted trees will withstand 15 degrees Fahrenheit, no problem, assuming they're well lignified. My younger trees over here, which grow and grow and grow because they're so young, and the growth here maybe isn't so hard, and it is a bit green, uh, this stuff here might get a bit damaged, like I said, by a hard frost. Um, or let's say it can only withstand temperatures down to maybe let's say 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can definitely push it and see and test it. You're not going to lose your tree because it got hit by a frost or a hard frost, you know, depending on how much growth your tree has. So let's, let's take this tree here as an example. It's very small. It didn't grow all that much. If this was all green and it wasn't brown and lignified like it is, I would say, well, this is a little dangerous because if it took a hard frost and got killed off, let's say this amount of growth got killed off and it's a young, weak tree, you may have an issue where it doesn't come back from the soil next year. You may have killed your tree. So something like this that's small and young and uh, isn't lignified well, I would be very cautious with. But everything else, it's good to let it get hit by a frost. You want to have a couple frosts, a couple light frosts before you really put these trees away for the winter time, uh, before you even do your pruning. So you want to make sure before we do any cuts on these trees, which we're going to come in here and do many cuts. I mean, a lot of the, I'm going to have a ton of cuttings this year. You absolutely do not want to prune them unless the tree is dormant. Don't feel pressured to do it. Don't feel pressured to cut a little bit earlier than you should. There's really no benefit. Um, I find the less sap flow that there is within the, uh, the tree, the better, um, in terms of the rooting process. And there's a whole debate on that. You could go either way with it, but let's say I were to take some cuttings now, even if I were to just take a leaf off of here, there's sap. And this sap, not only does it bother your skin, but it's still within the branches. It's still within the leaves. So if you were to chop off all that sap, all those carbohydrates, you're basically robbing your tree of those carbohydrates because the carbohydrates, what they'll do is if once they get hit by a couple frosts, the sap flow is going to go down through the branches and then down into the roots. And it's going to wait there. It's going to situate itself in those roots. And once it's in the roots, what's going to happen the following season is it's going to wake up and all that sap flow resumes and it comes from the roots, the bottoms of these trees, and then goes up. And that's how you get a really successful season is you end up having a lot of carbohydrates to start the year. We always talk about getting our trees off on the right foot, and getting them as early as possible. It starts really with getting your trees, you know, dormant. In the, in the fall. If you don't let them go dormant, they're not gonna have that sap flow rush that comes up and basically makes everything biologically beneficial, right? 
So people rob their trees of that process, and it, it's just kind of a bit sad, I think. Um, again, I don't know how beneficial really that is, but I imagine it's quite beneficial. I'm not a biologist, and I don't know really if there's been a study on this kind of topic, but I imagine it's super, super important. So the potted figs, like I said, they get hit with a frost, a couple of frosts, then they're dormant, right? It's not just enough sometimes for them to get hit with a frost and they drop most of their leaves. You want all the leaves off, you want to make sure the sap flow is stopped, you make a cut and the sap flow is almost non-existent there in the wood after you make a cut. Then you take the cuttings. Then we take our cuttings and then we put our trees away for the winter time. And well, if it's a potted tree, of course you can move it, right? In-ground tree, you can't move it. You could dig it up and you could put it in a pot and put it somewhere. You could also dig a giant hole and create a fig coffin. Some, some people do that. Um, you could dig up your trees, no, no, uh, no doubt about it. But um, what you could do with your potted trees and what you should do with your potted trees is that if the temperatures in the winter time where you're at get below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, you need to move your potted tree somewhere else. And for me, that's either underneath the sunroom, we put them in the greenhouse, and that keeps them at a colder temperature um, for a long extended period of time. So that'll keep them above 20. Um, actually, I think even the, below the sunroom here acts as like a root cellar. So it rarely, if ever, drops below 32. Um, and it takes a very long time in the spring. Here's the key gear, guys. It takes a very long time in the spring for the sunroom, this root cellar, to actually warm up. So they stay dormant longer in the spring in this environment. And if they didn't stay dormant longer, let's say they woke up in February, you guys have a basement that you put them in, you have a shed or a garage or something like that, which I'm sure many of you guys do, and it gets really warm in there in the spring or maybe even let's say February, which is, I've a lot of people message me in January and February, their trees woke up. You don't want that to happen. You wanna keep the temperatures down in these environments. Wherever you choose to stick your potted tree or even your in-ground tree, you wanna make sure it stays dormant for as long as you can because you wanna wait until there's no chance of frost. Once there's no chance of frost, you can bring these guys out here. Even a couple weeks before your average last frost date, you can bring them out here, let them sit on the patio and get them uh, going at the beginning of your season. But if they're, let's say they wake up and they're wake up, they woke up in your basement and there's no light, um, even if you had artificial light, it's just really a bad start to the season. That's probably the biggest mistake people make with a potted tree is overwintering it in the wrong spot um, or even just not letting it go dormant. So yeah, that's, that's a huge, huge recommendation. For the, for the in-ground trees, you, some of you guys may want to wrap them. Um, there's many techniques in terms of wrapping them, different materials. I would just go with something that you know works. And you know, maybe there's a, a method your neighbor has, um, whatever it is, but you want to make sure that when you're wrapping these guys, Excuse the noise there guys, but when you're wrapping these guys, what you want to do is before you wrap them, you got to make sure all the leaves are off the tree. You want to make sure there's no moisture being trapped inside the wrapping, because if there's any moisture that gets trapped, it's going to create mold. You're going to unwrap your tree in the spring and you're going to see a moldy dead tree. So you really need to pay attention, probably do it on a dry day. There is no real rush to do any of this stuff. Today is only, I think, uh, October 26th. And I'm not going to do any of this stuff probably until, uh, well, let's see. I'll probably do some minimal pruning in November. Maybe I get a couple frosts. Uh, I'll do definitely some bare rooting in early November um, after the first frost. A couple frosts go by. Maybe that even puts us in December. And then I'll take my cuttings. Uh, then I'll put them away. These in-ground trees right they're going to be here for quite some time so i'll do my pruning just like you guys would before you're wrapping sometime in december after a couple frosts then i will wrap them i'll choose a dry day i'll wrap them 
with whatever material you guys want. You don't want to let any moisture in, but you don't want to trap any moisture in either. And essentially, you're just going to bring all the branches together, tie them up, real simple. You just bring all these guys together like so, tie them up with some string, some twine, whatever it is, and then wrap it. Now, the other method that I like to do, there's a couple methods you guys can do, is that you can actually just cut them all down to nothing. Cut them all back down to six to 12 inches. That's called the cut and cover method. We're gonna get ourselves actually some straw. I have some bales of straw that I have to go pick up, but I have some material over here. We cover the trees that are cut back to such a small height, cover them with the straw, and then put a tarp over top of that. And make sure you tie the tarp down to the ground so it doesn't blow away. And this is a good way to cover a large area of figs, a high density like I have. The other things we can do is cut them back and then put up some low tunnels. And I thought about using that idea, some kind of uh, low tunnel system, but not, uh, not in the cards for me this year. What you can do as well is you can come over here, and I, my friend Brent does this, it works out real well, is that he basically has a, a line. Let's say you got a row of figs, and you got a post in the ground, put a line like you would for uh, your grapevines or something, and you can basically attach the, the branches to the line and just attach all these down. So you bend them down like this. Essentially something like this. Bend this down, attach them to the, to the wire, and then you just cover this with tarps or cover this with plastic, uh, whatever material you want. Um, you don't have to bend them all the way down to the ground. Of course, you could. You could set up some sort of system where it's kind of like a, a cordon a low cordon system, but this works out really well. You just bend them down. It makes it really easy to, to uh, protect them. And then in the spring, you just unveil this whole thing and they plop right back up to where they were, like you see, and then they resume growth. And it's actually a really good method. I, I think I'd recommend that probably more than just wrapping them, to be personally honest, with, perfectly honest with you, because it's it should be a lot less work and you could do a, a better high density system like that. Um, the other method is really just to get yourself um, some chicken wire. I don't have any chicken wire out here to show you, but chicken wire is real cheap. You get it at Home Depot. And essentially what we'll do is let's say, uh, let's say this pole here is the tree. We wrap the whole thing with chicken wire and then fill in the chicken wire. It keeps in all the material, fill that in with wood chips. And that works out really well. It's kind of like a cage for your wood chips. Kind of like this guy over here where essentially let's imagine this is a tree and then you've caged it in here and you fill this in with wood chips and it stays here around the main trunk of the tree and keeps it warm and insulated all year. Actually, here's a perfect example is you could just fill this cage in here with wood chips and uh, the wood chips is a great method because it, uh, it doesn't rot the bark. You can rot the bark on specific trees if the wood chips are there too long, maybe if you have a very wet winter time. But if you have big pieces, um, you're gonna be mostly successful with the wood chips. I've done it for a number of years. I wouldn't use straw. It's probably the worst material. You could also use leaves. Uh, leaves will work well. Now, other winter prep here, we're gonna basically get rid of this garden for the most part. Here's our summer garden for next year. We planted in the alliums. I just want to update you guys on this. And these are onions that basically we've multi-sown them essentially with sets. Bunch of onion sets planted together in clumps, eight inches apart, and they've sprouted and they will survive in the winter time here. Um, it's kind of what you have to do with, this is a two rows of garlic that we planted and they're looking really good. We've also put in recently some shallots and some elephant garlic from uh, a friend. And then we also have some elephant garlic that we purchased that we planted about on the 1st of October that's now sprouting. And what it will end up doing is kind of in between the rows of these alliums is in the spring, uh, actually maybe in, the, in like sometime around early June, we're going to plant our summer crops in between these rows. So in between these rows, we'll plant our summer crops 
Then the alliums come out and we're good to go. And it's a really good way to, I think, grow food in a very high density. Uh, the tomatoes are still kicking, you know. We are very, very close to frost. At least our average frost is only four days away. Something like that. What is it, November 31st? No, it's November 30th. So, yeah, we're only four days away from our average frost. And uh, we still have peppers. Oh, excuse me, guys. Still have peppers that are going. These are the Jimmy Nardellos. These are so incredibly productive. The Jimmy Nardello is ridiculous. What I could do is dig these up. And I think I might. My friend Dom does this. Shout out to Dom. And you could also do this with your eggplants. Dig them up. Put them in pots. Try to preserve as many of the roots as you can. And then overwinter them. And then in the spring, plant them out again. And you get some pretty massive tomato production and plants the following season. Um, but yeah, the tomatoes are still kicking. I have plenty of production that comes in here now. But as soon as we get that frost, it's pretty much over. Uh, I've been harvesting, believe it or not, pink brandywine for really the last, since they started. They started in October, or um, early August, I'm sorry. So they've been going nonstop. And it's just a testament, I think, to this growing method and growing them vertically um, as a single stem plant. It's, it's quite incredible. Um, personally, obviously a huge fan if that's the case. Um, other winter prep has involved the spring garden, the summer garden. And you can see we actually have um, our low tunnel set up with the plastic. And these guys, of course, are giving them a little bit more temperatures because what's going to happen soon, it's getting so cold, but the trees, the shade trees here, still have their leaves on them. And therefore, this area is actually quite cold. And I'd rather have it a little bit warmer if I can, which is what this plastic's doing. And everything underneath here is going to continue to grow. I'll be able to harvest this all throughout the winter, even into the spring next year with the help of this plastic. I have all kinds of stuff underneath here. What you could do at this time, if you don't want to do the plastic just yet, because we had our insect netting on here, you take the insect netting off, and then on top of that you put on, um, I think it's the mesh. No, it's fleece. You put the fleece on top, which actually adds about three to four to five degrees for these plants at this time of the year. Really quite nice. The plastic really warms things up. It's a huge dramatic difference. And um, I've just been harvesting, for the most part, some broccoli shoots. We're going to have Brussels sprouts that hopefully will form and come in at some point down here. Um, and this section is actually uh, where my cold frame will go. We have to attach the top of this on top of the cold frame. Uh, we have some seeds that we're going to collect um, and preserve and have that seed stock for next year. Um, you know, I think that's mostly it. I mean, going into the winter time, it's really all about your really sensitive things because, or I should say, going into this frost, it's all about the sensitive stuff. All these perennial fruit trees and perennial plants back here, the apples, the grapes, the plums, the pears, you know, they should be able to withstand the temperatures you're growing them in. Um, and if they are, then you can just leave them alone. And for the most of this, it's just going to get pruned actually in the in the late winter or in the dead of winter and uh, there's not really a whole rush to do much of anything other than in december when everything starts to really go dormant after they get hit by a couple frosts then we come in here we do our pruning we do our covering of the very sensitive plants and here's actually a little update on our pomegranate this is a uh, salavatsky it's grown quite well this year because it actually had some sunlight and last year it really didn't because we had it covered with tomatoes that were in its way but it grew well it's doing well it survived last winter time we'll see if it survives this one um, i have no doubts we're going to be looking at a perennial salavatsky pomegranate here uh, what i could also do is use this bed because it actually i have the bare bones of a low tunnel set up could have used that for some crops for the spring or for the winter time and I think that's roughly it here, guys. What you want to do is insulate well. Oh, one other thing. Um, 
If you guys have some potted trees, let's say you have some really hardy potted, potted trees, and you know what, there's also these citrus trees we'll go over in a minute. But let's say you have some hardy potted trees. I have some jujubes actually back there in the corner. Uh, my potted pomegranates, by the way, those I treat them the same way as the figs. Same temperature, same, you know, I move them underneath the sunroom, same deal. The jujubes are hardy down to zone five. So if they're hardy down to zone five, and I'm in zone seven, I can grow them and leave them outside all year. I don't have to heal the, the pot in the ground. I don't have to move the pot. I don't have to do anything with the pot. It's very simple. All I do is just leave it outside. You bundle up all of your really hardy varieties. I have a number of videos on this. You bundle them all up and then you can put straw around them to insulate the roots, insulate the pots. That keeps everything warm, keeps everything dormant for a long time into the spring so you don't get hit by an early frost or a late frost, I should say. Um, so that's, um, that's about, that's it with that. And then also we have these citrus trees, very, very simple. Uh, these guys will not withstand a zone seven winter. In fact, I don't know exactly what temperature, but on the safe side, you wanna keep them above 25 at the minimum for most of these varieties, but we're gonna bring these guys indoors and they are kind of just now house plants. Uh, when the temperatures get below 40, we want to start moving them indoors. In fact, any of my house plants I have over here that are just chilling and trying to get themselves a little bit more growth, we need to move them back inside as well when temperatures dip below 40. Um, we don't want to let them get hit by a frost. You can. It's not the end of the world, a light frost, but uh, we do want to protect these guys and give them every chance that they can survive indoors in it's just really not an ideal environment. So that when we bring them back out here again in the spring, they're really on a good foot and can then perform well. Plus, you know, some of these citrus trees here, guys, have fruits on them. This uh, has some limes on it, and then this guy is loaded with kumquats. So really quite important to keep these guys healthy. Otherwise, the fruits will fall off. You'll probably have some root rot. Maybe you have some pest pressure. I would probably spray them with uh, some kind of insecticide, whether that's soap or neem or something that you guys want to do because scale and spider mites can definitely become an issue on these trees indoors. Then you bring them inside and hopefully you don't overwater them and <laughs> you get yourself a successful citrus tree this winter time, or uh, I should say this spring. But yeah, thank you guys for watching this one. This is a pretty darn good video, I think, in terms of, you know, getting them all, uh, get, just addressing like every single thing in the yard in terms of what I do in the winter time. It's a pretty hectic time, um, but it's not really hectic until a couple of frosts come in and then that then the, the clock's kind of ticking at that point because yeah I guess I could do all my pruning now before the trees are even dormant um, but it's not the most ideal scenario and once that couple of frosts come in um, you want to make sure that you're not letting your trees unfortunately get exposed to like very very cold temperatures especially these figs you know, you probably don't want them. If you're going to cover them for the wintertime, they're not lignified well. You probably want to cover them when temperatures get below 15. And that did happen um, for a couple years now. Around Thanksgiving, it usually happens. And a lot of the trees in the ground, if you don't cover them at that time, can take some pretty significant damage. Um, so my plan here in the next really the next few weeks uh, is to get everything hopefully sorted through everything away and for good and then that way I don't have to worry about it till next year. Um, another big tip here guys, one last tip, is that you should stock up now on soil or mulch or anything you guys need because you may have to wait all the way until the spring and it could be too late. Maybe you want to do some up potting Maybe you want to do some seeding and you don't have any soil laying around. You just can't find good soil. So find your good soil that you guys like to use and just stockpile now. And that way you guys have it before the nurseries even consider 
having it in stock because if you're going to do some seed starting you know i start in like in february you could even start in january with like onions so you don't have any soil any soil lying around it could be kind of a mistake but all right guys hit that subscribe button for me we'll see everybody soon all right hope you guys uh stay safe out there and uh take care okay bye-bye